Time for a good old overanalyzing disclaimer. I have no idea how long this video is going to be. I don't know if there's a whole lot to say about this episode. So if the patron shoutouts end up being longer than me talking about Aang looking tired, only get mad at me like 60%, okay? Ooh, very subtle different take in the recap this time. They thought they'd get it by me. Here's Sokka confidently coining the Day of Black Sun in the original episode. The Day of Black Sun. And here he is saying it in a slightly more explaining tone in the recap. The Day of Black Sun. Interesting that there only ever seems to be one difference, if there is a difference, and never more. At least that I caught. The harbor surrounded by cliffs seemed like the perfect secluded place. Nice choice, Sokka. And we're here four days ahead of schedule. Huh, that seems pretty good. Almost like you didn't need to worry about the schedule all that much. Almost like this retroactively makes some other episode even stupider. Which one, I wonder? It's no secret that Aang in his many dreams pictures himself based off of a lot of different anime characters, so this one's obviously Goku from the Dragon Ball series. Now, I'm not super versed with anime, so I'll take my best shot at each one, but you guys might have to help me out in the comments. I might just be straight up wrong. A missable little detail on this first design here, though, is that Aang's wearing a headband, but this one has this classic blue airbender tattoo on it, rather than the upside down flame, which is cute. <laughs> Oh, hey, check it out. Ag's actually wearing his headband as the waist sash thing that it's actually supposed to be, just like the kids did back in the headband. Well, I better keep training. He's kicking the fuck out of that bush. That's good training. May I wash your feet, sir? Head massage? Hot towel? Wait, hold on, what? These two just did some pen and Teller shit. He had this bowl a second ago, and this guy was holding nothing. But then it looks like he gets this plate of hot towels from this guy somehow. Have I been mind-freaked? <laughs> Wait, do you think the Royals have creepy, obsessed fans in this world, too? This guy's even rocking Azula's hairstyle. <laughs> You can actually see this lady in the shot before, waiting, coldly calculating her moment to strike. You didn't take the palanquin. I'm just going to May's house. It's not far. It's not a prince's place to walk anywhere, sir. Seems like May is down a couple steps outside her door, but Zuko sees her at the top of them in this shot. He's punching the fuck out of that tree. Well, that's good training. You know, there is such a thing as overtraining. I don't know why, but I always thought that this effect really got across the feeling that Aang gets here. Like, you can kind of feel some sort of vibrational kickback with him. Uh, maybe I'm just crazy. Tom, why are you looking that way? Stop being silly. That's okay, Aang. The eclipse will block all firebending anyway. You don't need to know any. Plus, it's a stupid element. We can actually see Sokka studying some of the maps for his big speech coming up throughout the episode. I don't think he ever found any in the library because everything on the Fire Nation got torched. So I guess the next most logical thing would be that they sniped them from the boat they stole. Okay, well, I still have to work on everything else. I better spend the whole day training. For as goofy as this episode is, it does explore an interesting topic. That being the effect of pressure on kids. Growing up playing a lot of sports, I've seen a lot of kids put on pedestals and be treated like they're this big, great thing. When in reality, they're still just a kid. And it can be hard on them and really change their sense of self for the worse. Amp that up times 100 when the kid is literally the chosen one to save the world. Yeah, I could imagine that would be kind of stressful. I think this is a really cool angle to explore for a few minutes. Angus has been worried about this since he learned about it, basically, and the pressure has been building for months. This is just natural and it feels really human. More Ang foot scar. The gang got new sleeping bags too at some point. Last time I remember seeing them, they had these green ones, but now it seems like Sokka just has a straight up mattress. All right, this is what I'm talking about. To me, this could be any character from any anime ever. Uh, I know the main character from Hunter x Hunter has hair like this sometimes. Past that, probably gonna need some help on this one. He's circling the fuck out of those sheep. That's good training. If you can have anything you wanted right now, what would it be? Hmm, a big fancy fruit tart with rose petals on top. This might be the happiest we ever see May. She seems to be genuinely vibing, and I fuck with that energy. Wake up, sleepyhead. Rise and shine. You overslept. You missed the invasion. This is a really funny concept for a dream. If Aang really did somehow oversleep, I love the idea of Ozai showing up and being like, Ha! You missed your one chance, you fucking idiot! And then just leaving. Never mind, we're back to the green sleeping bags. Don't drink that! Oh, yeah. Why? Is it poison? 
I think this is a really underrated line read from Toph here. She's immediately extremely alarmed, and the only thing she can think of is that someone poisoned it. I just love the way she says it. Why? Is it poisoned? Throughout this episode, you can see Sokka working on Appa's armor, not just the one shot later when he mentions it. Reach up. Reach for the sun. Feel your chi paths clearing. Wait, Yoga can clear the chi paths? So if Aang kept at it long enough, we could have ended up with this? What are you wearing on your head? It's almost like the hat you made for Jet, but less cursed. So I guess there's a big war meeting coming up, huh? And apparently I'm not welcome there. I feel like a lot of people forget the Zuko part of this episode when they just throw it into the filler category, but there's a big moment in here for him later. It's a goofy episode, but it explores some important stuff. Well, there's one other thing we can try. Acupuncture. Okay, so Toph can see this porcupine thing from like one mile away, but Hama still snuck up on you guys? I think we have to assume Toph literally just let that happen, right? This scene is really strange. I kind of feel like it's cut into two separate scenes when it was originally one. May tells Zuko about the war meeting, and then the next time we see Zuko, he's talking to Zula about it. But the next next scene is Zuko back in that same room with May, seemingly at the same time of night, talking with the war meeting again. I feel like this scene was originally just one longer scene, but they cut it into two parts for some reason. Okay, here we go with this dream sequence. I don't really know if there's a whole lot to analyze. I think it's just a wild stress nightmare. I don't think there's a lot of symbolism here. I could get really pretentious about it and stretch and really look for stuff that really isn't there, but I'm not really about that. I just think this is a bunch of really cool, stressful images that captures what's going through Aang's head. There's only one thing I can do. I'm gonna stay awake straight through to the invasion. Toph approves, I guess? Invasion. All aboard for the invasion. Is Aang referencing his dream where Katara's hair got stuck on the train here? And you need to start wearing your hair up. In my dream, your hair got caught in a train and- Aang. You know, like a train conductor? All aboard? I'm doing it for the people I love. I'm doing it for you, Katara. Aang, what are you saying? I'm saying, I love you. So this is just a daydream, but I do kind of wish they saved the imagery of Katara and Aang kissing for when they actually do it, especially since it's less than an episode away from now. I feel like it kind of steals the visual impact of it, at least a little. Baby, you're my forever girl. Aang? Huh? Also, so Katara didn't just hear all that horrible dialogue Aang just spat out, but he still obviously pantomimed at least some of it out. That's some weird rules you got for your daydreams there, Aang. I'm trying to build up with some armor here so he doesn't have to go into the invasion naked. What? How did you make that? Where'd you get the materials? I know you had the money, but where did you buy them? Where? Now, I know what you're thinking. No way Noodle Ozai here looks exactly like the original Noodle Ozai, but nah, it actually looks pretty good. You've been awake too long. And you're acting downright weird. You've got to take care of yourself. Oh god, it's my sleep paralysis demon. God, they animated him 14 years ago. Oh god, oh fuck, oh shit. Yeah, leave the kid alone. Hey, who asked you? Guys, come on. Is this where people lose it in this episode? Because I can kind of see why. It just devolves into complete nonsense here. So if you're already on the verge of not having a good time, this being the tipping point makes sense. But then again, I hear a lot about how everyone loves this part of the episode with Oppa versus Momo and stuff. You'll have to tell me down in the comments if this is awesome or lame. I'm interested to see the general opinion. Hey look, it's the same choreography from the Zuko Zhao fight, except this one's a gag fight. Oh. That's probably not a good sign for the Zuko Zhao fight, huh? Here we get a better shot of Ozai's mural, showing better the industrial themes behind it. There must have been some kind of big push for technology under him, even though he's only been ruling for a few years. During the meeting, I was the perfect prince. The son my father wanted. But I wasn't me. See what I mean? This is a giant moment for Zuko right here, hidden away in this wacky-ass episode. This isn't just all Looney Tunes stuff, it's got some important things too. Listen to me. You've been training for this since the day we met. Well, I mean, you did traipse around the Southern Earth Kingdom for a few weeks before Aang learned that he had to cram, but I am just being a dick about it. You're smart, brave, and strong enough. You really think so? We all do. You can do this. You're ready. You're the man, Twinkle Toes. Hey, more friendship stuff. These guys are just genuinely supportive of Aang when he really needs it, and that feels nice. And Aang actually gets to pay this gesture back to most of them in future episodes, which also feels nice. This is nice. I feel nice. 
Okay, but one thing I don't need is Toph's creepy pasta ass smile here. I could do without that, actually. Really? You're gonna take me out? You're not even wearing pants. No, Fire Lord Ozai. You're not wearing pants. Is angreaming of Ozai with no pants on okay? Is that allowed? Should we cut that? You know what? This episode isn't so bad. There's a lot of hate for it, but like I've said many a time before, it fills a role. What is Avatar to you? Is it all bloodbending witches in the woods and invasions of foreign countries? No, it's a goofy show with great characters that you love to be around. This episode is sandwiched between a very dark episode in The Puppet Master and two very plot-critical episodes in The Invasion, and I think taking a moment to remind us that this is a fun show isn't bad at all. It's a little much sometimes, I'll give you that, but for the most part, it's just fun. It's entertaining. Personally, I'm not watching Avatar for it to be serious all the time. Plus, you've got the good old dour Zuko shit. It's not all just nonsense. And we actually see kind of a turning point for Zuko, too. I think this episode captures a lot of the things that people forget that they love about Avatar, and they just don't like it all rapid fire all at once. So to me, for an episode, it's not that bad. Hey, guess what? Subscribe. Do it. Here's a picture of a reptile I found on Google Images. Do it! Patron shoutouts! If you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Shoutouts to my top page. Patrons Andrew Edwards, who saved 20 babies from 20 different disasters in a 48-hour span. Butterscotch, who unlocked the F-13 key on their keyboard. Buddha Jacker, the only man known to be both an astronaut and a cosmonaut. Charlie Rock Quigley, who is immune to most poisons, including the deadly Iacane powder. Daniel Ward, whose phone number is 1. Eric Barney, who survived a plane crash. The plane crashed into him, and he lived. Etc., who if looks could kill, they'd be genocidal. Finnish Blood, who has to carry a license on them for each joint of their body because they're all classified as deadly weapons. Fred Sullivan, who has been called the next step in human evolution. Garrett Kane, who made a lemonade stand as a kid and made a better salad than your dad. Harrison P., who can access the Vatican archives if he asks nicely. Jared Berkman, who most of the album Jock Jams was written about. Jess, who cut off one of her fingers just to see if she could grow it back, and she could. John, newest Archduke of the Slam Zone. Keith Clausen, who can look left and right at the same time. Phantom Lord Daddy, who I saw open a beer just by yelling at it. Sean Martin, who broke a window and then I just saw him put it back together. It was crazy. The Sinking Bubble, who literally can't even. And you freaking nerd who has their own abstract art gallery that's just an empty room. That's the art. That it's empty. Deep. And my other fuck you money patrons, Agent Rhino, Brendan Murphy, Donnie Snow, Dylan Calvo, Caitlin, Kennedy Stapleton, Luke Herrera, Max Lewandowski, Nick Kapanen, Omega Fighter, Skylos, Useless Princess Backwards, Tiago Nascimento, Varunda, and Zumpy. And of course my god analyzers, Alex Fritz, Ali QPZM, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Big Thirsty, Bran Muffin, Bingo Dingo, Canon Corpse, Charles Barnett, Chase Brignac, Dan Bertel, Daniel Nordzidge, David Carlisle, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Dominic Saint, Distant, Earth 2, John, Eleanor Rose, Eric Ross, Garrett Kane, Hobie Wan Kenobi, It's Carton, Jay Lambo, Jeremy Rubenstein, Jimbo, John Ajaka, Jot Moreland, Joshua Bone, Joshua Haskett, Juice Pouch Grape, Justin Scott, Kadex, Keon Gillilin, Lady Serena, Lehman Russ, Literal NASA Rocket Scientist, Matthew Stargell, Mr. Airborne, Mitchell Gobrecht, Mortius 007, Nickel Pickle 582, Nicholas Abbott, Omar, Parky Parky Boom Man, Peter Bayron, Radiator Rat, Rocket Mist, Shadow Fox Nero, Sky Not Darkened, Spory, Stein One, Super Super Snipper, Tiny Knight, Travis Chestnut, Triad Juice, Whales Red, and Wolfman Dan. Next up is the Day of Black Sun, the Invasion. Shit, we're really getting there, aren't we?